Welcome to another in a series of conversations uh, with the provost, but I am Richard Dean Benjamin, the Associate Dean for the College of Health Sciences, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here and also to introduce you to our speaker this afternoon. And as you know, the university strategic plan places a strong emphasis on providing students with the tools to succeed. To that end, this series of conversations on teaching and learning has focused on ways to foster creative learning, to encourage student independence, and to inspire teaching. I'm pleased to join, pleased to join with the Center for Learning and Teaching to present today's conversation by Michelle Darby, eminent scholar, university professor, and chair of the School of Dental Hygiene. Michelle is the author of three books and has published over 50, 50 refereed articles. She has served as the editor of Educational Directions and of Dental Hygiene and as associate professor of the International Journal of Dental Hygiene. As a guest of the Chinese Ministry of Health and Education, she was a member of the first delegation of dental hygienists for a visit to the People's Republic of China. She has lectured in eight other countries across the globe and has been a Fulbright Distinguished Scholar at Jordan University of Science and Technology. This afternoon, she intends to help us think about thinking. What actions can prom promote critical thinking? She will offer us a practical approach, the use of point-counterpoint which she says teaches students how to think, not what to think. And she will invite us to discuss this topic among others, always a good way for faculty to learn. I hope that you will engage in the conversation and I'm pleased to present Professor Michelle Darby. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Uh, I see some of my colleagues from Jordan are here too, so thank you for, for being here. Uh, one of the things uh, as, a, as a teacher, as a faculty member, we probably don't spend enough time thinking about how we teach. I mean, if your days are like my days and your weeks are like my weeks, we're really focusing on scholarship, committee work, uh, planning, uh, QEP, all of these things that, that are somewhat related to teaching, but certainly not directly related to what we do in the classroom or in the laboratory or in the clinic. And I, I found this, in, prep, in preparing for this presentation, I found this little cartoon that I want to share with you. And it says, I teach my kids that these things are right and these things are wrong, period. End of story. Wouldn't that teach them to believe anything they're told without applying any critical thinking? Oh, I don't think about that. <laughs> so this is an opportunity, I think, today for us to reflect on critical thinking and what we do as teachers, as professors in the classroom to stimulate critical thinking. I don't think that uh, from, from my reading about critical thinking, you know, this isn't really an endpoint, it's more of a process. And we hope that the outcome of this process continues to improve. But in and of itself, we don't stop critical thinking or we don't, we don't have critical thinking or not have critical thinking. There are various levels of critical thinking. And some of us are, are strong critical thinkers and some of us still have room to improve as critical thinkers. And it, it doesn't matter whether we're students or we're faculty. And I'd like to just share with you a little information that I collected uh, in preparation for today. And that is the Association of American Colleges and Universities in one of their reports stated that as few as 6% of college seniors were proficient in critical thinking. That's a pretty scary statistic, wouldn't you think? Given the fact that it's us, we are preparing the future teachers, we're preparing the future healthcare professionals, the engineers, the scientists, yet 
only 6% of college seniors demonstrate critical thinking. Now, I have, just to get us thinking about uh, this subject, I have a little exercise for us to do. So just very quickly, take one of these handouts. We just need to uh, worry about the very first page of the handout. And I'd like you to just uh, read each of these statements and indicate on, this, on the survey here whether you agree or disagree with a statement. So we're just going to take a minute to do this. Do you agree or disagree with this statement? Everyone about finished? Okay, let's just kind of reflect on this survey for a moment. We're not going to go through each and every item, but I want you to know that reading uh, the results of Robert Boostrom, who developed this kind of quick and dirty survey, he has reported that regardless of who he gives this survey to, whether it is teachers from kindergarten to 12th grade, or whether it's professors at universities or instructors at community colleges, the opinions are split on most of these questions. So about 50% of the people will agree with each of these statements and about 50% will disagree with each of these statements. Now, I'm not gonna do a poll here, but I wanna focus on two of the statements in particular. Uh, item eight, and item 13. Now item 8 states, in general, students do not exhibit uh, genuine critical thinking. How many people here agreed? Okay, so most of the people here agreed, okay? And number 13, students in my classes are required to think critically. How many people agree? Okay. Well, what he finds in doing this survey is that most people, or most faculty, will agree to both of these. That they feel that the, the students do not exhibit critical thinking. However, they are requiring students to think critically. So there's a disconnect there. Do you see that? If we are all committed and we, we all believe that we are preparing students to actually be critical thinkers, yet we don't feel that they are criti critical thinkers, then where are we going wrong? Obviously, this is a very difficult area to conceptualize, and it's a very difficult area to kind of get your, your mind around and think about and actually achieve. However, I think we can all agree that critical thinking is one of the major goals in education today. Now, I want you to do another quick little exercise. If you turn the page, if you turn the page, you'll see some questions here. I only want you to respond to the very first question. And just take a minute and free write, you know, what is critical thinking to you? When you think of the term critical thinking, what does that mean? Okay, time is up. Now, who would like to share their definition of critical thinking? It doesn't even have to be a definition. It could be ideas or phrases. Go ahead. Oh, asking Ann why. Ann Taylor from the philosophy department. Asking the question why, looking at both sides of an issue. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. Answering the question of why and, and looking at both sides of issues. Anybody else would like to add to that definition? Kimberly. Well, I think it encompasses a reflection, time for insights, testing of assumptions and analysis. Okay. Added to that, uh, self-reflection, testing of insights, of assumptions, and focusing on insights, getting new insights. Anyone else would like to contribute? Go ahead, Allison. I thought that it was maybe bringing all of one's vast stores of knowledge to the learning of something new. Okay. So extending uh, our knowledge base in some new and creative way. Okay. All of these 
ideas comprise critical thinking. Now, when I looked at the literature, these were some of the definitions that I found. And uh, believe me, there are hundreds of definitions of, of critical thinking. And for the most part, in my opinion, none of them really capture critical thinking. Uh, they're almost an oversimplification of critical thinking. And let's just look at one here. Thinking that is purposeful, reasoned, and goal-directed. Goal the ability to solve problems, I think we heard that, the ability to solve problems by making sense of information using creative, intuitive, logical, and analytical mental processes. Skills in judging information, evaluating alternative evidence, arguing with solid reason. I think that's what you were getting to, uh, Ann Taylor. Uh, I, if any of you use uh, Bloom's taxonomy in preparing your syllabi, preparing the objectives that you have for your students, most of us probably focus on the higher cognitive levels within Bloom's taxonomy. And so these are just some examples of those uh, higher cognitive levels that we try to get our students to demonstrate through various activities. Now, it was interesting to me to find uh, that probably about two decades ago, uh, the American Philosophical Association, so I'm, I'm glad that there are some philosophers here and maybe you can add to some of this, but the American Philosophical Association put together a consensus group of experts on critical thinking. And some of you may be aware of this group and uh, their work has been updated over the past 20 years. But their original work was back 20 years ago. And what they did was they, they came together and their charge was to conceptualize critical thinking. Because they felt that you know, the measures, you, in order to measure critical thinking, you have to have a working definition. You have to conceptualize critical thinking. And I found this to be very interesting because what they did was they distilled many of the behaviors that we find in Bloom's taxonomy down to six core skills. And that this, these six core skills are what comprises the core of critical thinking. And these skills include explanation, that is the ability to provide rationale for your position, a position that you take. Can you, can you provide rationale? Uh, analysis, can you break a subject apart and do comparisons and contrasts? Can you evaluate, that is, can you determine the credibility of information? Can you interpret? What's the significance of this? What's the meaning of this? Inference, they felt, was very important because when you can infer, you can step beyond a conclusion and you can project into the future. And that they felt that that was an important component of critical thinking. And the one that I found to be very interesting was this concept of self-regulation. It's a concept that we have in, in dental hygiene but it's not quite the same concept uh, as it is here. But self-regulation refers to the fact that if someone is a strong critical thinker, they can not only do all of these, these uh, behaviors, they can apply these behaviors or these skills, but they can also reflect back on their own thinking. They self-regulate, they self-correct, they are critical of their own thinking processes. And that that should be one of the outcomes of critical thinking. You know, we do, if we do critical thinking in the classroom or critical thinking in, in the laboratory, what happens when the student leaves our classroom or leaves the university? They need to reach the level where they can self-correct. They can critically think about their own critical thinking. And that's kind of the concept of self-regulation. Uh, and Kimberly, you hit upon this idea of reflection. 
And that's something that we, we are seeing more and more of in the literature. I don't know if you're seeing a lot of that in, in the literature within your disciplines, but the, it's the idea or the notion that you know it's not enough just to go through the procedures and then get on to something else and then do these steps and get on to something else. That we need to factor in the importance with our students and ourselves to kind of reflect back so that we give ourselves the opportunity to self-regulate. Uh, now, in their definition or in their conceptualization of critical thinking, they talked about those skills that we just looked at, those six core critical thinking skills. But then they also added another dimension to critical thinking. And this dimension is an affective dimension. And it's called critical thinking disposition. Has anyone ever heard of this concept before that you know, when you think about thinking, it's not only the skills, but it is the inclination to engage in effortful thinking. It's the motivation to engage in effortful thinking. That people can, can have the skills, the cognitive skills to be a critical thinker, but unless they are motivated to actually apply those skills, they may not be critical thinkers in everyday life. Is that, is that am I making any sense there? Okay, so when, when, when we think about critical thinking then, we can think about the behavior of behaviors, the core behaviors, but we also need to be thinking about how people value these behaviors. And if they value the behaviors, they're more likely to use their behaviors in everyday life. Now, what are some of these affective dispositions of strong critical thinkers? And this too, I'm going back, this was what this um, consensus panel from the American uh, Philosophical Society came up with. And these are the affective, the affective uh, dimensions of critical thinking. Inquisitiveness with a wide range of issues. Concern to become and remain well informed. Alertness to opportunities to use critical thinking. Trust in the process of critical thinking. Self-confidence in one's ability. And that, that has uh, some implications for how we nurture these affective dimensions of critical thinking with our students. You know, if we start out with challenges that are too overwhelming and students don't have the confidence to solve the problems, that we might be squelching critical thinking. So we need to start with you know, smaller problems, smaller challenges, and build. Um, Open-mindedness regarding diverse and divergent views. So you know, giving students an opportunity to hear divergent views. Flexibility in considering alternatives. Understanding of the opinions of others. Fair-mindedness, honesty, in facing one's own biases. This is part of that self-reflection piece. You know, being honest with ourselves, we're not perfect. But if, if we are thinking and we are analyzing and we are coming up with decisions that may have biases or prejudices, that we're cognizant of that and we're able to then self-correct. Uh, prudence in suspending, making, or altering judgments. And uh, I think this is an important piece because, again, many times when we give students problems to solve, we want them to solve the problem fast. Solve the problem. Here it is. Here's the answer. And really, there are times when we should be sus uh, suspending judgment. And maybe there are times when we can't come to a conclusion. And that's as valid as an activity as solving the problem. Maybe we just have to delay our decision. And willingness to reconsider and revise views where reflection suggests needed change. Uh, now, I'd like you to just uh, take another moment and ask your, an answer, why is critical thinking important? Why is critical thinking important? 
Why is critical thinking important? Because it opposes dogmatism, prejudice, credulity, and gullibility. That's correct. <laughs> Why is it important for someone, from someone else's perspective? You know, how many of our students come with, as you say, dogma? I think that too often convention is what dictates our behavior. We do things because that's the way they're always done. Mm -hmm. And without, credibility, without um, critical thinking, then we don't challenge that convention. Okay. We don't make decisions based on data or reason. We do it because everybody else does. Okay. It's done. So it's an opportunity to break out of the status quo. Any other answers here? Mohammed. It will help us actually reach uh, deep learning instead of just surface learning on okay. one side. Okay, and so deeper learning. Exactly. Uh, with more depth and perhaps more breadth mm -hmm. also. Yeah. And maybe also be a good citizen. Okay, absolutely. And for all of those reasons, decision making in the real world, uh, uh, we're a part of that democratic society and if we want have a democratic society people need to be able to make good decisions what's the flip side of, of not making good decisions I mean we see it all the time we see it in the newspaper you know bad decisions are are the result of you know our economic crisis would you agree bad decisions uh, even disease why people have dis disease, certain diseases that are preventable. It's because of bad decisions. Unwanted pregnancies, failure from school, loss of jobs, all related to critical thinking. So critical thinking goes beyond the classroom. Uh, if, we, if we want to contribute to society as teachers, our students really do need to be uh, stronger critical thinkers. And then, of course, we have mandates for accountability. Uh, we have the QEP that's going on right now, which is related, I think, to critical thinking. Even though it's reflective writing, it's critical thinking. And in dental hygiene, my discipline, we are mandated in our accreditation standards from the American Dental Association to demonstrate how we have threaded problem solving and critical thinking throughout our curriculum. So it's, it's very important. To us. Now, how do we encourage critical thinking? And this little cartoon, I expect you all to be independent, innovative, critical thinkers who will do exactly as I say. Self-reflection time. Um, what do we do? What, what do we do that might inhibit critical thinking? What are some behaviors as faculty that might inhibit critical thinking? Well, we grade, we evaluate, we decide whether the things are right or wrong. So if students want to be right, then they give us the opinion they want to hear or that we want to hear. Okay. So I think that what you're saying is many times we create the environment where there might be only one answer. And in the real world, is there really only one answer? Is there only one right answer? So. We need to think about how we teach and what we expect from our students. Any other ideas on how we discourage critical thinking? Any other thoughts on that? Maybe by providing too much information, I, I probably don't need a mic. By providing too much information to students and let, instead of letting them um, go out and find it on their own. Okay, maybe providing too much information, absolutely. That feeling that I have to teach the content of this course, right? We all have that experience. We got to get through this content, got to cover the next two chapters by, you know, November the 20th before the semester ends and, and that kind of mentality. And it's, it's an easier way of teaching, correct? I mean, you can just kind of go in, do your thing, give them the facts. They spit the facts back to you, end of story. Any other factors that we might be doing that inhibits critical thinking? No other ideas? You're my idea person here. <laughs> um, 
I think we also don't give students the opportunity to evaluate materials that we give them. You know, we provide a textbook or we provide readings and these are the expert sources mm -hmm. without saying, you know, as much do you agree with this expert source? I mean, mm -hmm. how often do we have our students evaluate our textbooks and decide whether mm -hmm. they're effective or not effective? So I think just not encouraging and promoting that sort of evaluation of us and of other experts. Right, right. And I think this is something that you and I were talking about the other day. Uh, uh, making it a more level playing field that, you know, we're not necessarily the experts, but we're the facilitators of the, of the information. It, it's, it's like, don't tell a student anything that they could, that you could show them. And don't show them anything that they could do themselves. And you know, focusing on that aspect of what can they do themselves without us. Now, here are some of the things from the literature that we can do to encourage critical thinking. And I'm sure that many of you probably had this on your, your papers. Uh, asking open questions, you know, the what's, the how's, the why's, questions that allow students to open up their thinking as opposed to closing their thinking. You know, we certainly don't want to ask them uh, questions that they just need to respond yes or no to. Um, uh, let's say, how are you using this evidence in your presentation? Why did you use this source as opposed to another source? What is your rationale for this argument that, you're, that you have just put together? Why, you know, what, is, what is your rationale? Asking those open-ended questions. And then something that the, our QEP is, is based on is this responding in writing. And I really like this technique of responding in writing because if you're in a classroom of 50 students and you ask a question, who always answers the question? <laughs> right? And she always answers the question. And what do the other students do? They check out, right? They check out because she's going to answer the question. But we want to make everyone answer the question. And by just giving students that little bit of time to write their thoughts out, even if they're not willing to share those thoughts with the class, it does help in their critical thinking. And I think that's a really good little technique to use. Uh, I, I just discovered, a, 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 I went to a, a workshop, and I'm going to try using this in my class next semester. But they said that what you do is you give every student two cents. So you have, you're, you're going to have a discussion, right? That's the, that's the class day. You're going to have the discussion. You give everybody two cents. And so they have to use their two cents. They don't use their two cents, you get it back, okay? But if they use their two cents, they have to think about what it is they're gonna contribute, how, whether it's a question or a comment, and, and, and it just kind of distributes the, the participation a little better. I haven't tried it myself yet, but I'm gonna try it next semester. Uh, having students gather their own evidence, gather opinions of others, gather the beliefs of others. Um, you know, about two weeks ago, I think Karen Polanco was doing this presentation, and she was really um, very strong that, that uh, debates need to be based on evidence. And although I believe that, I also think that there is a big affect in terms of people and their beliefs. And it's, it's an area that we can't ignore. And you see that even with uh, you know, debates about climate change. You know, all the evidence sh supports climate change, but then you still have these people who have their own opinions and their own values regarding uh, what climate change is, whether it even exists, or what should be done about it. So it's an opportunity, I think, to allow the students not to just look at the evidence, but also consider people's opinions and beliefs because that's always going to affect decision making too. Uh, weighing pros and cons. Uh, asking about risks and benefits. Making students, giving them time to generate alternatives before they come to a decision. Uh, making them support their <coughs> positions. 
what make, made you say that? You know, what are you basing this on? Uh, and then focusing on outcomes. I mean, what, why are we doing this? We, we want to make better decision makers. That's one of the outcomes. We want people who are self-reflective. Uh, so outcomes are very important. Uh, other ways of encouraging critical thinking through scientific method certainly is a critical thinking process in the health sciences and dental hygiene. With our students in the clinic, they all use what we call the process of care. Every patient they see is assessed, a pro the problems are identified or diagnosed, they have the treatment plan, they implement strategies based on evidence, it has to be an evidence-based strategy in order to solve the, the patient's problem, and then that's not enough. They still have to evaluate the outcome of their care. And so that whole loop, even if you, you know, you're thinking about patient care, it's, it's critical thinking. Uh, cases, using cases and problem-based learning. Uh, simulations, uh, allowing students to do creative e expression when there's an opportunity to do that in the class. Uh, critiques, critiquing of articles, critiquing of literature. Uh, critical reflection. Um, how many people here do critical reflection with their students? Not very many, okay. Um, I have, in my research for this presentation, I came across this really good piece that I'm, I'm, I'm happy to share with anyone, and it's called What is Critical Reflection? And uh, it, it, I think it's very good because a lot of the critical reflection is critical thinking. And they gave some very interesting rubrics on how to evaluate critical thinking. And it really uh, gave me a lot of ideas and it made me think that I really have to revise my rubric for critical thinking. But it was interesting to me because they take various skills and you have to evaluate the student according to whether or not the skill exists or whether they're novices at carrying out this skill or whether they're proficient at carrying out this skill, whether they're advanced in carrying out this skill or whether they're distinguished in carrying out the skill. So I like this approach because it seemed to be very good for giving students feedback about where they are as critical thinkers. So again, I'm more than happy to share this. Uh, it, was, it, uh, it, it, it really uh, gave me a lot of ideas, and I think we're going to end up using that too in our community service activities so that when students go out into the community, they do <coughs> critical reflection as part of the learning experience. But the one thing that I wanted to talk about today is how I personally use crit critical thinking uh, in one of my classes. How do I encourage critical thinking in one of my classes? And one of the things that I do is I use debates. We call it the debate, but it's probably more of a point-counterpoint because we don't follow all the rules of a debate. But what we basically do, and yeah, I'll just give you a quick definition, presupposes an established position uh, on an issue. Well, we really focus a lot on issues in healthcare and in dentistry and in providing healthcare to people uh, that do not have access to care. So those are kind of the, the issues that we tend to address. But what we do in this class, and I'm going to back up for a minute because this is a class in professional development and uh, it's kind of a capstone course for our seniors. <laughs> So it's, the, it's, it's one of the last courses they will take before they graduate, and we're really trying to prepare them uh, for the issues that they will face as professional dental hygienists. And one of the things that we do, because dental hygienists are highly regulated, just like any other health professional, they're, they're highly regulated, early in the semester, in fact, it's the second week of the semester, we actually take a bus to Richmond. We charter a bus, we go to Richmond, and we spend a day in the General Assembly. And we do this so that they understand who it is who regulates them, and when we want to uh, put forth a bill to change or expand our scope of practice, they understand how that works. 
We go into committees and we see people, lobbyists, special interest groups, private citizens, presenting testimony in committee in order to change the law. You know, people have bills. So it's a really exciting day. They get to see this. So then we come back and, uh, well, they also see the General Assembly itself in, in action too. But then they come back and one of the things we do is we identify four or five themes that we're, they're going to be um, a theme for one of the class sessions. So four or five of these class sessions are going to have a theme. And one of the themes that we use is healthcare reform. Okay. So there will be one week, and the students will know this in advance because they're going to need to prepare for this in advance. They, they choose topics, and, and actually I put the topics together. And in this theme area of healthcare reform, universal health insurance, employer-funded health insurance, Obamacare, health savings accounts, maybe some of the topics. And they, they, we tweak them, you know, uh, as, as the years go by because issues change. And the students will sign up for these topics. And as they sign up for these topics, and this, this word here really should be eight to 10, uh, it shouldn't be eight to 10 per topic, it should be eight to 10 per theme. But each of the students has a topic. And their challenge is to come up with an argument that supports this particular topic as a healthcare reform uh, uh, option or to negate that particular topic, to not support it. And the students have to use evidence, but they also use policy documents. They're allowed to use documents, for example, from the Pew Foundation or the Kaiser Foundation um, or the uh, Institute of Medicine frequently comes out with documents. Uh, the um, uh, the uh, Surgeon General comes out with various documents on the oral health of the nation, so they use that. And it's up to them to put together an argument for one of these topics in support of that topic or against that topic. So it is a, you know, a, a point, counterpoint kind of an argument. Now, they have to do this in about 10 to 12 minutes. That is, when they do their actual presentation, presenting their, their stance, that message has to be done in 10 to 12 minutes. And that's a pretty big challenge for some of these topics. But the goal here is, is to get the students to make sure they understand what is fact, what is opinion, what is a false claim. Uh, are there any special interest groups here that, that uh, are, are supporting or negating this particular topic. They need to be able to develop convincing arguments and to predict consequences if this was established as, our, uh, as a healthcare reform in this example, and also to question their own personal biases and prejudices. And you'd be surprised how many students will come to me and basically say, you know, I'm doing this topic and I really don't believe what I have to do. You know, I, I don't believe it. And I say, it doesn't matter. You don't have to believe it. The fact that you are now taking a different point of view is going to stretch your thinking about this topic. So I like it when they don't believe in the topic. And they still have to work to present an, an, an argument. Now, how do we do this in, in class? That the day uh, they will have, they have uh, time to prepare. Uh, I do use some classroom time to let the groups get together because that, you know that's always an argument. We can't, we don't have time to get together. So we do spend some initial planning time breaking up into these groups and I just kind of float around the class and make sure that they're on the right track. I don't want them to present what I believe. I want them to present an argument based on the literature, the evidence, the policy papers, the position papers that they gather. Um, and then the day of that theme, my eight to, eight to 10 students are in the front of the classroom and they present. They present their argument without interruption. And these students at this point have already used 
some of those core skills, correct? You know, they've analyzed, they've e evaluated, they've inferred, uh, uh, they have interpreted, and now they're, they're, they're presenting that to, to the class. And I tell the class that we're gonna pretend, we're gonna pretend that we are the General Assembly. And the General Assembly is gonna make a decision based <laughs> on how effectively we influence them with our arguments. So it's a little bit of role playing, but it's, it's kind of fun role playing, and students, students do get into it. Uh, now after everyone has an opportunity to make their presentations, then only those individuals who were involved directly in the research get to do a rebuttal. So they can ask questions, they can challenge the validity of the data that was presented, uh, they might bring out, and it's something that I want them to do, bring out what is the level of rigor of the evidence that, that you've used. Is this strong evidence or is this evidence weaker evidence? And you know, what constitutes stronger and weaker evidence? They should know that already because they've had their research course. So we're sort of building on even past courses that they've had so that they can do this. So they're challenging these arguments. And then once that group has had their opportunity to challenge each other, we open it up to the class. And the class can then answer questions, uh, ask questions, they can do their own challenging, and it's a, it's, a, it's a way of expanding the perspectives. And that's what we're trying to do, expanding their worldview of things. Because most of them have only heard what is discussed in their own homes. They don't have a, a wider view. So this is an opportunity for them to get that wider perspective. And then lastly, after we finish, there's a debriefing se session. And the debriefing is a time to reflect. Did you, did you discover anything today that was surprising to you? Did any of your opinions change? So from what you knew about healthcare reform, do you have different opinions now on the kind of insurance you might select for your own family or what you would want for your own children 10 or 20 years from now? So this is our debriefing or our self-reflection period. And then of course uh, we, we focus on, you know, earlier in the semester when they're putting this all together, it is group work, they work together. Um, and the literature, the research shows that group work results in higher uh, cognitive, the development of higher cognitive skills. And so we do that for a reason. The group work in, it helps with the, the problem solving and the higher level critical skills. But they are graded as individuals. And in my experience here, the individuals who do not do well are actually those who do not work in the group. Because one of the things I, I, I saw, we do not want to hear redundancy. I don't want the same, I don't want different people coming up and saying the same thing over and over again. If it's redundant, it's because you didn't work together as a group to bring your, your argument forward clearly and with diversity. Now, the rubric that I use, and I've attached that to your handout, not because I think it's a brilliant rubric, but it's what I use. And uh, it, the, the um, areas that I try to touch on in this rubric, um, like at the beginning, uh, the significance of the issue is explained. That's basically, you know, interpretation. Supportive statistics, research findings, uh, positions, opinions. Encouraging open-mindedness. You know, remember those, those uh, dispositions that we talked about earlier, those affective dispositions. Um, implications, that's an inference. Uh, you know, seeing consequences into the future. Uh, the evidence base, you know, are, have they analyzed the issue? You know, were they able to compare and contrast? Were they able to break that issue down so that it's clear? Uh, interpretation, are they seeing the significance of what they're presenting? Uh, under conclusions in summary, you know, is there a conclusion based on the evidence? Does the conclusion relate to the evidence that was presented? 
or maybe it's we don't we should not we should not be concluding uh, making a conclusion at this point. In essence, we should be you know keeping the discussion going because maybe it's too premature to make a decision. So so on and so forth. You know the whole idea that uh, we're trying to get the students to think this way in a num number of different settings, not just in the classroom. So that's, that's kind of the approach, and this is really the rubric I wanna, I wanna revise based on this uh, information that I found out about reflective, critical reflect reflective thinking. It, I think that there's a lot of potential there to do a better job. And I also uh, have a, a website here that you can go to. They have a number of rubrics uh, and it was, it was, it's, it's the Association of American Colleges and Universities.org. I really never went to their website before, but I just sort of found it uh, by total accident. And they really have a lot of good documents. Uh, and they have that, the document about uh, the critical thinking from the American uh, Philosophical Association too, which I found to be very, very interesting. And uh, just in terms of some value-added benefits of, of using more of a point-counterpoint uh, teaching strategy, learning strategy, uh, a lot of students, they don't like to get up in front of the class and present anything. They don't even want to answer a question, right? You have that experience. And this definitely pushes them outside their comfort zone. But they're pushed outside their comfort zone in a pretty nurturing environment. So not too much could happen. And we try to get that across to them, that you know, you're in a safe environment, but you're gonna be faced with these issues once you graduate. And aren't you gonna be happy that you heard about these issues and you're well versed on these issues because you've had this experience, as opposed to going out and practicing, somebody say something to you about these issues and you know nothing about them. So, so we try to convince them, some of them, that this is, this is what they're, they're gonna do. And it is outside their comfort zone, but they have to do it. It holds the class's attention much better than I could hold the class's attention. Because they like to see what their friends are gonna present. And for the most part, they're very supportive. Uh, it is evidence-based decision-making plus the affective domain, which we feel is very important in dental hygiene in terms of learning. Uh, it is an opportunity for them to practice their public speaking skills. And we are able to cover a lot more evidence-based and policy type of information than I would ever be able to research myself and cover for the class. And so they are really doing the work. Uh, in terms of limitations, it is anxiety provoking in some learners. Uh, some people see this as competition uh, and that that something that should not be occurring in a classroom. But again, you know, the winning is not the issue here. Uh, this is not a win-lose situation. Even though it's pro and con, it's not a, a win-lose situation. We're, we're winning because we are being exposed to so many different viewpoints. Uh, students may be uncomfortable in a confrontational environment. And I like this little cartoon uh, and my eyes are really bad here, but it says, you know, here's the teacher saying to this little girl, just go to www.criticalthinking.com and click on answers. So the question that we have to ask ourselves is, are we prepared to engage students in this manner? Um, uh, maybe it's, it's about 27 after, no, 23 after, and I've, I've done a lot of talking. I'd like to hear some comments from you all. Uh, there is more information, but I think that this might be a good time to just stop and uh, maybe share with us some of the things that you do in your classroom to promote critical thinking so that we have some additional ideas. I do not feel that I am a, a critical thinking expert. I, I want you all to know that. I'm, I'm just muddling through this just like we all do and hoping to do the best uh, by our students. I always like to say that I like to teach my students the way I would want my own children taught. It's sort of my, been my motto. Uh, so anyone willing to share? Thank you. See, this isn't a sharing, this is a question. Okay. I don't know whether you want it or whether you want sharing. Oh, oh I, 
I guess I don't have a choice because you're, we're doing critical thinking, right? <laughs> Go ahead. <coughs> um, I'm going back to the third slide you gave us at the beginning. I was just curious. This is the one from the American Association of Colleges and Universities from 2005. Uh -huh. That said that as few as 6% uh, of college uh, seniors are proficient in critical thinking. And it, this goes to the question that you actually have on the very bottom of the question mm -hmm. and answer sheet you gave us mm -hmm. um, about how critical thinking is measured. So I have two questions for mm -hmm. you. Maybe the, the mm -hmm. second one is more open-ended. But do you know how they measured that? That is, how did they try to figure that out? Because uh, it strikes me as an odd sort of thing as to how mm -hmm. they could have tried to determine. Well, you know, one of the problems is the definitions of critical thinking and how people measure critical thinking throughout the literature. So you can have critical thinking evaluated in one study, critical thinking evaluated in another, and it's all different because, the, because of how it's been conceptualized and measured. But I can't remember the exact way they measured it, but it was a standardized tool. It was a standardized tool. Uh, uh, let me just say something else. Uh, one of the things that I found very interesting as I was doing the reading in this area uh, in preparation for today was that um, there is moderate correlation between critical thinking and SAT scores. Okay, so SAT measures something different than critical thinking. Uh, there is, in some studies, there is no correlation between critical thinking and GPA, okay? And in other studies, there is a correlation between critical thinking and reading comprehension. And when you think about the amount that our students read, do you think it's a lot? No, I know it's not. It's not a lot. And when I saw that statistic, and I kind of put those pieces together, I really think that we need to do a lot more reading, expecting students to read, but it doesn't, not just here, but starting when they're, you know, two years old, if not earlier. They need to do more reading because the evidence suggests that reading and critical thinking skills you know, kind of support each other and go together. Um, writing also, and I think that's writing, uh, critical writing also relates to critical thinking skills because if you're writing, you need to be critically thinking about what it is you're gonna put on paper and you put, that criti you're, you put your critical thoughts on paper. And that's another thing that we don't do enough of. I mean, I'm, I'm a lot older than you and I know when, when I went to school, you know, we, we didn't do op scans. We did these little blue, blue, blue books for examinations, okay? And the literature suggests that open-ended questions, using open-ended questions is a better way of measuring critical thinking. Um, that was the second part of my question. Oh, I thought that was. I was reading your mind. <laughs> uh, uh, but it can be done using multiple choice questions, but this is what you have to do. You have to have a case or a problem so that you present the students with information that they have to work with, okay? So they're presented with a case or a problem, and then when you pose multiple choice questions, you should be asking for, we should be asking for, what is the best answer? Do you see what I mean? As opposed to there's not one right answer, but what is the best answer? So that several of the answers should be fairly close and they need to be able to decipher, you know, the best answer based on the data that are given. Uh, but multiple, uh, multiple measuring devices are important for measuring uh, critical thinking, one, one approach is not a, you know, does not fit every, everything unless we're using a standardized instrument uh, because we're measuring the curriculum across four years. But if we're talking about classroom measurement, making sure our rubrics reflect the core critical thinking skills, that our, our rubric should reflect that. Thank That's you. a, okay. Any other questions or comments? 
thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. And uh, I look forward to when you all are up here too. Okay. Thank you, Michelle. I just want to encourage the rest of you to attend. Boy, I need my glasses too. Um, in two weeks when Janice Hawkins talks about partnering with students for publication. And I want to commend you for doing something. Mohammed said it makes them good citizens. And oh. it struck me that it's, it, it really does. Mm -hmm. What you're doing in the classroom mm -hmm. really makes them whole mm -hmm. persons. It's mm -hmm. way beyond the classroom. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks. you.